Well, this morning we want to start a little study of the meaning of the terms we associate with knowledge. So I selected two terms that represent perhaps the polarized opposites of learning. They are knowledge and wisdom. Now, knowledge is something we all know about. It is conveyed to us through the public school system. We live it every day. Everyone who comes into the world practically is trained into some phase of it. Even aboriginal people have their own standards of knowledge. And knowledge is very largely concerned with the problem of getting along in this world. How to live in the environment which no one really fits into exactly. Knowledge, therefore, is the knowledge of the folk. It is the thing we all depend upon for a common agreement on the ordinary subjects of daily existence. This idea of knowledge, however, is very service, is very surface. It is not depth, it is not wisdom, it is not insight. It is the communication of the common decisions of people. It is the way we have decided to teach our children. And what we are going to teach them is the knowledge that we know. And the knowledge that we know, I might mention, is not very good. We have a great deal of education, but what are we teaching? Are we teaching the individual to grow, or are we trying to train him for a job? And in most cases, knowledge today is training for a job. It is not only training for a job, but tra training for a very impermanent job. By the time we get the fellow trained, the job isn't there, which is, of course, a little embarrassing. We are noticing this particularly in the age of computers. Many, many young people who went into stenographic schools and learned to run a typewriter find that they are not going to gain very much from that education. The very instruments that they were taught upon are now obsolete. So much of no so-called knowledge is obsolete. It lingers on as long as there is any excuse for it. And there are many arts and crafts that have become obsolete in the present century. I think the old story of the buggy whip is probably as good as any. A man invented a buggy whip. It was the finest thing that was ever invented. He worked with it, built a factory, manufactured them, and spent 20 years selling bobby whips. And then the car came along. And in a very short time, there were only a few luxury families that had carriages and horses anymore. He had outlived his own invention. He had gradually depended upon something that was passing. And knowledge is, for the most part, passing. It does not have any solid foundations in eternity. Knowledge is a way of looking at something, a particular way. This way may change any day. This also is a way of approximating our understanding of what is wise and what is not wise. Knowledge gives us the history of the activities of our people. It gives us a certain history of our own nation and our own world. But this history deals with situations that no longer exist. Or if they do exist, to become so subordinated that we gain very little from continuing to maintain them. So knowledge, we have to say, is a surface thing. It is adapted to the whims of the hour. It is adjusted to the needs of the moment. And this is what we get when we go to public school. We do not get from the schooling any broad depth of understanding concerning human nature. We do not learn any high ideals about the destiny of man. We are not even allowed to bring in any religious factors, for faith they will disturb the so-called placid sur surface of the existing chaos. This situation, it means that we have knowledge. Knowledge that will fit only in certain, certain situations. We send a child to school 
and they bring home the paper and tell us what they're learning. This learning they're getting now is not what we got when we were the children. We were the children. Changes have come. Everything is different. The old ways are outgrown. Or the old facilities are no longer available. Now, as we live today in this environment, we realize that we are gradually changing the world in which we live. We are changing the surface of the earth. We are crowding communities. We are endangering the basic utilities of life. We keep right on going, trying to continue a policy that is gradually cutting life out from under us. So this is what we have to think about. Therefore, what we commonly call knowledge is simply a story of doing what we always have done as nearly as possible, or continuing the way of doing as we do now, which is probably not possible. But at the particular moment we graduate the young folks from high school, they will get a picture of our present condition with all the negative factors overlooked and the positive factors exaggerated. So out of this we come to a surface knowledge, a kind of superficial effort to estimate our own responsibility in a world which takes no responsibility for anything. We find in all the arts we find this change constantly taking place. In the, in the sciences, they are not immune. Religious theories change. Architecture changes. And as we look around us, most of these changes appear to be for the worse. We're not doing as well as we did. Our buildings do not look as beautiful as they did in the Renaissance. Our music is not as good as it was in the lyric 19th century. Everything seems to be getting brittle, disillusioned, and more or less discouraged. So we build in a discouragement into the educational system. We decree that all these things must pass away. And we have great publicity over this. We have tremendous talk about correcting this and changing that and building something else. But it all represents what we would call knowledge. Knowledge is our effort to understand things as it is or to perpetuate through education policies that are almost deficient themselves. So, this is one way of looking at it. And also, all knowledge is from the outside. We get our knowledge out of books. We get the, our knowledge out of listening. We get our knowledge out of looking. But everything is of, as of now. It is as of the individual facing the future by estimating the exact circumstances which are in force the day he enters the future. He, by the time he's ready to leave the future, or rather let the future leave him, it may be entirely different. So now we have a problem of education. Well, how, how are we going to educate people for a world that may not exist by the time they get out of school? This doesn't mean the world is going to fall apart, but it means that policies are going to change, values are going to change, and gradually and inevitably materialism is going to slip away. And of course, knowledge is essentially anchored in materialism. It is the way in which we try to understand the kind of a world we have created, which has little or nothing to do with the world as it really is. It is a world deprived of its beauties, of its values, of its friendships, of its affections, and of its community projects. It is a world of rugged individualism, moving largely on a basis of profit, and determined definitely to perpetuate the conditions as they are now, which they can't do. So we go around and we study. We, uh, we take courses in language, because maybe... We will want one of them one of these days. A second language is a major asset today, which in itself is a proof that regardless how we think or what we believe, we are moving into a larger one-world unity in which one language is not enough. We also have arts that are fighting for survival. We have that tremendously inconsistent situation 
in which we are paying two and a half million dollars for a Picasso sketch. And at the same time, we are paying four million dollars for a genuine Rubens. These things are absolutely irresponsible. The sketch and the Rubens are not even in the same classification. And yet we have put a new value on both, money. And the uh, same thing is happening all over the country and all over the world. The auction galleries are completely uh, swamped with people willing to spend fabulous sums for something they don't even understand. Now, why don't they understand it? Why don't we understand art in its best sense? Why don't we understand music in its best sense? It's God isn't taught. If you want any of these specialties, you have to go to a specialized institution which specializes in them. And you'll then be fortunate if you find one with sufficient idealism to make the period of study worthwhile. So we now have knowledge. We have knowledge in science. But they, every time we look at knowledge now, we are sort of told that this is the ultimate. This is the absolute fulfillment of all these dreams. If we get this space platform out, it is going to change the course of ages. The most thing it's probably going to do is to run us further short in essential commodities. There is no reason to believe that if we put this spaceship out there long enough, it's going to solve anything. Because we're not out there. We're here. And we're using up the precious resources of here so that we can spend a few weeks out there. Which isn't particularly valuable. We have all kinds of projects that are built upon what we think now. Our idea of the conquest of space is that we're going to be able to colonize it or find a possible use for it in the form of a garbage pail out there. We are believing definitely that space is something we're going to exploit as we have exploited everything else. And yet all the way along, we do not really solve anything. We do not understand anything. We are born ignorant and we die ignorant. And in between, we learn to make a living and if you learn to make a fortune. And when the whole thing is shaken down, where are we? The great values do not grow because we do not permit them to grow. We have no real reason to believe that we want to improve. We really only just want to stay the way we are and have more. We want to be a little wealthier, we'd like to be a little more famous, and we'd like a good solid contract with some studio for a million dollars a year. The idea of really growing, of improving ourselves. The question I talked to a young man not long ago, I said, why don't you try improving yourself? Well, he says, do you know anyone who's doing any better than I am? <laughs> why should I improve myself? Nobody else does. And this is what is happening to a world that has a public school system, has all kinds of advantages, and is staffed by individuals who are completely devoid of real understanding of what value constitutes. Where are the philosophers of the 20th century? Where will be the philosophers of the 21st century? Are they all going to do what they are doing now, keep their noses so close to the grindstone that they can't see anything beyond the mess they are creating now? This all ends in the problem that knowledge is not the end. Knowledge is not a real end of anything. It is simply a becoming aware of the way things are being mishandled at the moment. It also has something to do with the idea that if we can make the same mistakes, we may be able to be as rich as the people we don't like. <laughs> but this is going to be a little difficult. So we have now this wide right world, art, sciences, nations, academies, institutes, everything you can think of all dedicated to some great program and no great program. No actual realization. The only thing we have is a great mass movement against which a few thoughtful individuals have braced themselves in an effort to survive the common uh, contagion. So we ought to have to remember 
that when science says it has a cure for something, it'll have a different cure next year. When we buy something because it is best, then there was never one like it. Within two years, there will be a one much better. All the way along, these things go, but when it comes to the values of life, are the, is the American home any stronger than it was? Are our young people growing up clean? Are the various forms of business we're involved in, are they honorable? Uh, is the average person building a character that he can live with for the rest of his life? Are we fair to the children or the aged? Or to the sick or the well? To the rich or the poor? Everything goes along carefully covering up the weaknesses of every phase of it. And under the general heading of knowledge, we place a limitation upon what we can think, what we can believe, and how we should interpret the facts of life. So now, here and there, there is a breaking through into another dimension. Knowledge is beginning to mean something that solves something, rather than simply perpetuates. We know that young people are going to school. Knowledge now is how to get sufficient insights to get a good job. Also, while this is happening, the moral structure of youth is collapsing. And with this fall, falls also most of the older generation. We do not recognize that by living on the surface of thinking, we are condemning ourselves uh, to the errors and fallacies of surface living. We are not here to live on the surface of the mind. We are not here to live only on the pleasures of the mind or the pleasures of the flesh or the pleasures of the heart or the pleasures of luxury. We are here as individuals to improve, to grow, to think, and to understand life. We are also here, if possible, to see that we can pass on to another generation a world a little better for our having been here rather than a world falling apart because of our mistaken understanding. Now, on the opposite side of this is wisdom. Now, how shall we define wisdom? Wisdom is no longer a surface. Wisdom is now an interpretation of value. Every bit of so-called knowledge is capable of being examined by wisdom. There is nothing that we do, nothing that we have, nothing that we hope, that does not in some way tie in to the concept of wisdom. And wisdom can be such, uh, suggested as meaning. It is the something that amounts to something. It is something that makes an experience more important than 30 days in jail. It is something that makes it more important to stay sober than to try to get sober. Wisdom begins to use the ideas of that we find in knowledge and ensoul them, give character to them, give meaning to them, and bestow upon each one of them a dimension of growth. All growth has to be included. The knowledge has to grow. And the moment knowledge grows now, it becomes associated with fallacies because of inexperience. We are not able now to use knowledge in a dimension of growth. Actually, knowledge comes to us from the outside. The interpretation of knowledge comes to us from the inside. We are gradually learning that from the inside of ourselves, we have to explain the things that are happening in the outside world. Now, this isn't easy, because the things that are happening on the outside are inconsistent with most of the values that come from the internal life of the person. The thing that has made this matter endurable is the fact that the inside, the wisdom of the individual has not been developed. Therefore, with the fallacies of the moment, there is no remarkable, intense rebellion from within him. Rebellion is a very individual matter. The individual who's had enough misery and enough suffering decides to do what he can about it. On the other hand, many under the same provocation do nothing. But one of the problems is that knowledge is valuable 
only to the degree that it can be ensouled, that it can be enriched to become meaningful, to stand for something that will help to advance the general state of mankind. So we look around a little bit to see what we can do, if possible, to increase the development of wisdom. Well, what shall we say is the best place to look for wisdom? Well, for the most part, wisdom belongs to what we call idealism. Idealism is motivation. When an ideal is stated, it means that the motivation is constructive. Uh, constructive motivation means that it is dedicated to common good, that it is dedicated to well-being, that it is not going to compromise to allow for the corruption of value. So when we begin to think of wisdom, we take the home that is broken by knowledge and put it together again by mercy. We try to do something to mend with the heart that which has been injured by the mind. We do everything that we can to ensoul the knowledge that has hurt us. And in so doing, we discover that this knowledge can suddenly become a tremendous source of good. But it is only good when it is ensouled. There is no good in the fact that it is a general average or adage that we honesty is the best policy. It is only transformed into wisdom when the practice of of, uh, honesty proves this and proves it by changing the patterns of life. Life goes on under knowledge. Life is changed under wisdom. Life grows because deeper and fuller meanings are bestowed upon it. It challenges the individual to grow. It does not leave him to be born and to die in the same misery. It does not leave him with a broken home or rebellious children. It does not leave him with incurable ailments caused by his own foolishness. All the way along, wisdom cures, heals, transforms into a better way of life. And yet it has to work with the same factors. The individual has to keep the job. But having kept the job, the wisdom steps in and tries to do something to this job, by means of which the person working in it is not only making a living, but is making a life, a life that is important. If the individual can go to work every week, every morning, nine o'clock for 40 years, and come out at the end of that time simply old and tired, and yet with the same job and with the same limitations, the individual who has a certain genius for growth within himself can transform this by conquering the job, by making something out of it that fulfills and getting away from the monotony of worthlessness. That is another one of the problems of knowledge. Knowledge can become worthless because of boredom and exhaustion. We are tired of making the same mistake We are tired of sitting at the same desk for a lifetime. We are tired of working with the same situations that arise frequently. We are tired of the wars that call upon us. We are tired of the false peace that come with them. We are tired with everything that is falling apart and is failing to grow. Now, we have only limited facilities, but there is always something that can be done about this. And I've noticed in working with people who have become despondent over conditions of life, that nearly all of them are despondent because they have been unable in their own minds to accomplish a transmutation of something monotonous, objectionable, or debilitating. Yet there is an alchemy that comes with wisdom. Alchemy is the power to transform base metals into gold. It is the power to transform the daily experiences of life into a meaningful pattern of growth so that the individual will leave this world a better person than he was when he came in. Today he may be a worse person. So we have this problem of what are we going to do about it? How are we going to change these things? How are we going to transform the monotony of knowledge into the dynamics of wisdom? 
Now, one thing about the monotony is that, as one friend told me once, he didn't like monotony because it was so monotonous. <laughs> and uh, this is very largely true. There is no excitement, no thrill, no achievement, nothing but keeping on and hoping that the job will last longer than we do. This is not very much of an inducement. So we have to try to find out how we can get some of these circumstances into our present knowledge. Well, one of the things we have to do is to realize that much of this we have to do ourselves. We have to recognize the need of becoming involved in the progress we hope to achieve. The young family with two or three small children cannot depend upon the public school system to get him out or get these children out of the monotonous, comparatively meaningless despondency which comes constantly with knowledge that has no outlet. So the problem is that they, the, ref, the reforms have to begin themselves in the person. And Ben Franklin was a great exponent of common sense. To him, common sense was the most uncommon thing in the world because common sense was the power of the non-scholastic to control and direct a life. Common sense tells us what we can do when we are tired of perpetual failure within ourselves. We go and study at the Sorbonne, we do here at Heidelberg, we do all these things, but we're still working with knowledge on the same level. We are still trying to get an art or a science, a craft or a trade, but we are not trying to become better people. We're not trying to grow, we're trying to find ways to get rich without too much hard work. So these things do not satisfy very well. But supposing we recognize the importance that common sense comes on where monotony and so-called knowledge fail. Now, common sense is just natural honesty. It is an intuitive grasp of realities and is probably the most powerful educating force that there is. And yet we don't dare to trust to it because common sense may teach us to get to go in the opposite direction from that in which we look for profit and fame. So we have to start with something. And those who are out of school and about settle down in life have a great opportunity to begin to experiment with the ensouling of facts. When a fact ensouled becomes a truth, and we are in need of more truths, we are needing very definitely people whose vision extends far enough into the future to really understand what we're up against, but to really know the condition we're building for ourselves. There's a lot of talk now about the 21st century, and there's a lot of evidence wandering around that we're already trying to ruin it. Not because we mean to, but because we're taking knowledge instead of wisdom to work with. We are not trying to learn how to change that which has obviously failed. We are trying to figure some way to perpetuate that which was never real. So we have to think a little bit about getting into line for more wisdom and uh, getting prepared to realize that everything in nature consists of a body and a soul. Now, we can't hard to think of the soul as being associated with logic, we can't have difficulty in imagining that things that are the common peri uh, usage of mankind have souls. And yet arithmetic has a soul. Music has a soul. Art has a soul. Digging ditches has a soul. Every profession has a soul, and a more exalted one. And most of the members of the profession do not live up to it. Over 2,000 years ago, the oath of Hippocrates was given to medicine. And we have spent the last century trying to get rid of it. We do not want it because it demands idealism. It demands integrity. And makes the physician, first of all, the servant of all the gods. This is in the spirit of wisdom. But we're trying to get it back down again into the spirit of knowledge. We know the code. We can recite it, but we can't use it. 
And that's because we are not building into ourselves the common sense, the natural virtues and integrities which are bestowed by nature and mutilated by human nature. So we are now looking for some way to get into a better condition to face into the future. And I think one of the common things that we can do is simply to postulate that anything that we are doing has levels and strata for us to consider. When we consider going into business, this is also a moral decision, not merely an economic one. We do not expect to have all things run smoothly, but we do expect that everything will teach us something of value. And value is not to be determined in terms of wealth or fame. Value is the unfoldment of the internal potential of the divinely endowed part of man. And progress is the individual growing up to himself because within each of us is something that is infinitely wiser and infinitely better than our own daily conduct. There is hardly anyone who could not improve. And there are very few to whom improvement would not be valuable. So we begin to think of all the ways in which we can use what we commonly call knowledge to increase wisdom, to make it possible for us to have a better world to live in and to become better people in this world. So now let's see what happens when we start in with wisdom. Now where does wisdom come from? The uh, wisdom was developed by the ancients for one purpose alone, and that was to learn to understand the meaning of existence. Now, there are various ways in which you can get some idea of this meaning. We can start with knowledge, and we can read a book on archaeology, or on astronomy, or engineering, or any subject, and learn all the interesting and fantastic things that we are gradually accumulating in the forms of knowledge. Yet we can go on and do all these things and they become intellectual. And we can take an examination and pass. And because we have passed the examination, we get the good job. But with the whole thing, there's been absolutely no improvement of anything. We are simply perpetuating the blind alley. We are going on continually glorifying the way it is instead of working earnestly to establish the way it should be. Every problem has an answer. And the answer means that we have to change our own relationship to that problem. We have to ensoul the power within ourselves which will give us the right to judge the problem. I think one of the problems that we've come in now to also is religion. In the fact that from a very early time, the various peoples of the world developed religious codes. These codes, they did not affirm they created themselves. Probably many of them they did, however. But so far as they knew, these codes had come from some deep hidden source within themselves or within the soul of the world. And the, the, the idea of religion was that all things that exist bear witness to soul, bear witness to the remarkable value behind it. The individual can spend his whole life studying carrot, but he can never see, apparently understand how to create a carrot. There is, he can use the things that are, but he doesn't understand them. He only understands their market value. He only understands why the dietitian says he should eat them. But the great pattern of the purpose of things, extending all the way from the infinite of the cosmos to the most minute atom. All these things have meaning. And until we find our own place in this great chain of circumstances, we will never be able to change the world to meet the law. We are never going to be able to change the law to meet us. And that's one of our difficulties. We are constantly reshaping laws. We are changing laws that we created ourselves in the first place. So we go with them as long as we can stand our own creations and then we do something about that and we put an appendix on it or we put a various codicils to it so that we can continue to go along the same general path. But the actual answer to the problem is 
the average person, even the average education, educated person, has very little understanding of where we came from, why we are here, or where we are going. These are the great realities without which an enduring culture can never be built. And we are not even looking for them. We are only looking for all the secrets of science, particularly those that can be commercialized. We are not aware of the grand pattern of a human soul, that there is in each one of us a divine life that has come into exile in this world. And the reason it's an exile is because we have been here before and set up the exile. We come back to the, the work that we have done ourselves. We come back to our own mistakes. We come back to the ignorance that we started with, or perhaps a little worse. And we are not even willing to recognize the fact that we are missing the real purpose of life, growth. Now, what do we say when growth? Well, growth is not necessarily has anything to do with wealth or fame. Growth is the ability to handle constructively situations that we have previously mishandled. If we become, through growth, wiser than we are, we can become better than we are. But without becoming wiser, we can never become better. Wisdom is not intellectual either. We think of it as long beards gazing in great stone tablets or something of this nature. Not at all. Wisdom is no more remarkable than Benjamin Franklin's almanac. Wisdom breaks down finally to common sense. Common sense, but it's common sense in a universe in which the very structure of that universe is common sense. Everything about the universe makes sense. Everything that man does about it is dubious. We're not at all sure that he's gaining on it. But it is true beyond any question that the simple facts of existence are the basis of wisdom. Wisdom is not learning another language. Wisdom is to learn a language so that we can talk to another man. All things are for use value, and that use is not for profit, but for growth. So we are constantly working to build new uh, echoes and new sounds and tones to enrich the relationships of life. In about ten years now, we're going to enter a new century. At the present moment, we're all tremendously excited over the prospect. In fact, we're not only excited, but many people are frightened to death. All the way along the way, everyone is looking and trying to figure out what we're going to do with the remaining ten years of this century. Now, probably Ben Franklin would say very fairly, forget the 21st century, do it right now in the last years of the 20th century and you'll have nothing to worry about. You have nothing to worry about when you start keeping the rules. And you don't have to set aside, aside a period many years from now when you're going to start doing that. This idea that we have that the, that the universe is most made up of sections which come into manifestation and in those various sections are the various skills are the various ideals or the integrities which are to be developed at that time. The truth of the matter is, these integrities must be developed in all times, in all conditions, and in every phase of existence. We want to go into the 20th first century. We'd like to be able to hope that we'd be able to stand the drinking water as late as that, that we will also find some kind of a way to get the sewage out of our basements. We are also hoping to save a forest or two, merely to show, be able to show people what a tree looked like. All of this type of thing is a little ridiculous, I know. But the point is very definitely that we have got to do something to change anything. And the power to change is the power of wisdom. Now the ancients tried to develop a way to getting wisdom. And they came to a conclusion that I think we're going to have to come to again. Namely, that wisdom cannot be forced upon mankind. Wisdom cannot be stuck down the human throat. It cannot be legislated into existence. And it cannot be perpetuated by people who don't want it. So the ancients decided to divide uh, a group apart. They took those who yearned after righteousness and who sought knowledge 
and who had that dedication to the common good that was necessary for the perpetuation of progress and created the schools of wisdom, the Platonic schools, the Pythagorean schools, these uh, various mysteries of Egypt and Greece and all the other countries for the training of people who wanted to know the reality. They, they, they needed to know that there was something beyond the commonplace. But they tried to tell it to everyone. Those who didn't care diluted it, perverted it, destroyed it. Therefore, they created a rule uh, to control the dissemination of essential knowledge. They said that, the, that knowledge could, has to be perpetuated by the right kind of person that they, you can't just simply toss it on the surface of light and expect it to find a safe place to hide or to live. We have to be able to recognize that the attainment of knowledge is the highest labor of mankind and that the attainment of knowledge is the basis of all philanthropy, the basis of all unselfishness, the basis of all cooperation, and the strengthening of all the constructive emotions of the human being. Therefore, to do this, it must be discipline. And all ancient people set aside certain disciplines for those who wanted to know the truth more than anything else. Of these they called the mystery schools. They were the schools of Egypt and all these different systems, Phoenicia, Chaldea. They were the schools of the island of Como, they were even the schools that continued down into the Middle Ages, finally became the labor unions. It was a case of where there had to be a group of dedicated people to keep alive the forces which protect mankind. And this dedicated group had to show by their action and by the consequences of their works that they were the defenders of mankind, that they were the most important thing in all the world, those who sought to serve the truth. Now we have this coming into religion and for Christendom the Christ mystery is probably the most important of all these dedications. Christianity is actually a real problem of wisdom. Now it might sound as though wisdom is all intellectual but it is not. The greatest of all wisdom is the love of truth the love of reality, of the brotherhood of human life. But in this time, the, the development of certain laws of reality, and we're going to have to some way get back to some of this. We're going to have to have some place honorable, recognized, and supported by which those who desire to live better have a chance to do so. And where those who have the in inside information in certain matters have a chance to express their internal convictions. Now, religion has for a long time provided certain phases of this. Even today in the 20th century, where science very largely is materialistic, it lives and moves and has its being in the presence of religion. And uh, every day we are learning in the present world st stress that religion is not something to be discarded. That if there is anything exact, it is religion, not science. Because the inevitable consequence of the misuse of power is moral punishment. And it also is that religion can prove conclusively that the only way in which the individual can protect himself and his world is by the development of integrities. He has to become a better person if he expects to make a better world. So we are now going to have somewhere along the line the science of redemption. We are going to have a gradual rising of peoples who believe that the greatest of all knowledge is the knowledge to live an enlightened life. That all other things are decorations or incidental. Even a, a trade or a profession or a career is incidental to the basic fact that all professions and all careers exist primarily to help the individual to grow. No part of our civilization was originally founded on the profit system. 
It was founded on the prophet, spelt as a prophet or sage. Actually, therefore, we are working constantly to create a situation. And we are watching knowledge. We are watching the expansion of knowledge. We are beginning to recognize that a lot of knowledge isn't doing anything. We are also recognizing that the knowledge is leading in the wrong direction. That it is helping to perpetuate that which is doomed to fail. Therefore, we have philosophy coming in. And philosophy becomes the basis of a kind of wisdom. And out of it comes the final decision, which is the proof of wisdom. The decision to do that which is according to the integrities of the divine plan. The individual who obeys the universal law is wise. Any wisdom, that so-called, that does not recognize this fact is not wise. And we have already had years and years of corrupted wisdom. We've had years and years of pseudo-knowledge. And we are now very much in need of the real thing. We also are in recognizing that all the different changes that come in society are constantly convicting us of our own fallacies. Most of the problems that we have today didn't exist 25, 50 years ago. We were living in a different, much more co co cohesive way. We are no longer in that way. We have broken down the walls and barriers which gave us some protection. There is no longer any respect for the laws of the personal relationships. There is no respect for parents or the aged. There is no respect for truth. And very little respect for teachers, because so many of the teachers are not teaching the facts. So all around is all these things need curing. And in this curing, we take the various forms of knowledge and we begin to try to ensoul them. We say, take the knowledge, for example, uh, of, a, of a mathematical career. Now, there is a great deal to be said for that. The average mathematician studies primarily for the purpose of advancing some science or for adding a certain uh, uh, control to various mathematical problems. But actually, mathematics is part of the Platonic wisdom. Plato says, God geometrizes. God also chemicalizes. God is the father of astronomy. God is the power behind every form of knowledge. And in its own essence, every form of knowledge is correct. Every form of knowledge is founded upon universal laws and universal realities. Because we're not much interested in those things, we sort of discard them or forget them or let somebody else worry about them while we do things that are a little different. We prefer to think in terms of mathematics as a laboratory work. We want to do something like, uh, oh my goodness, look what wonderful things uh, Einstein did. Einstein just put, a, put, put mathematics together, and what did he do? He discovered something that made it the death of all of us. He gave us the bomb. Now, this is a little story of what we're all doing. In the development of great mechanistic civilization, a great materialism in a world where materialism can never win, but by balancing only these factors of physical existence, thinking only in terms of our own extensions, even though we live but a few years. Although all this goes along, we're not going to get anywhere. Uh, wisdom, true wisdom, could use mathematics for a thousand years without ever developing a bomb. Why did we develop it? Because we needed a big mistake to take care of a lot of little ones. We needed a big danger to create peace. So, we did that there. And what have we got? A continuing danger that will continue and place in the hands of anarchy means of controlling human destiny. But the powers of things are not going to permit this. There is bound to be the, the reckoning. Nature cannot be deceived. And, the, and the nature cannot be stopped. Its own realities must involve the correction of things which are contrary to nature's wish. 
So what do we do? We start out to build a new kind of civilization over garbage heaps. Uh, they fall in and we have a lot of trouble. We have tried to get rid of the bugs, so we spray the food and die of the spray. Everything works in the same way. Because no one in these different departments is working for solution. They're working to how to maintain the thing as it is. How to prevent the bugs from eating it. But not necessarily doing anything to change the patterns upon which these, upon which these things are built. And uh, I remember very definitely when I was talking with Luther Burbank. Uh, he pointed out, he said, if the plant is healthy, there will be no bugs. It must first be sick. And when it is sick, it is weak. And when it is weak, the carnivores came in. And the insects come in. And the fungus comes in. But it doesn't come into a healthy animal or a healthy plant. The, the problems we have socially do not come into a healthy world. They do not come into a healthy nation or a healthy level of life. The reason why things go wrong is because we destroy the integrities which prevent them from going wrong. We do not realize what we are doing. We are all trying to have the plant and eat it too. And uh, we watch and we see what happens. We watch the plagues break out. There is every reason to assume that most of the problems that we face today are the direct results of the vibratory patterns which we are setting up by mass thinking. We are all working on certain problems, but millions of people are working on only one or two problems. How to get rich, how to stay beautiful, or how to get well. All these things are co correcting, uh, are corrupting our way of life. Our idea of getting healthy is to take care of the body, but not the soul. Another problem, I talked to a, a lady who was quite authority on the subject. Why do we, why do the girls want to be beautiful? And he, she pointed out that there are two ways of being beautiful. One is to have it on the outside, and in a few years it's gone. And the other is to have it on the inside, and it will last as long as you live and carry you into a better life beyond. Everything must get at the sources. We need a better level of thinking. We've got to take the facts and make truths out of them. We've got to take the knowledge that we have and redeem it to save it from the corruptions of the uh, selfish and the unscrupulous. There is no way that we can have a better world unless we become better people. And that is the problem that I think we're all working with and very seriously at this time. The great need, the need of the regeneration, the alchemy of transforming uh, selfishness into charity, transforming self-centeredness into soul-centeredness, and allowing the realities to lead the way rather than to drift if possible somewhere in the background. We have so many things to work with, so many opportunities and so many privileges, but we notice something is happening. If these privileges are slowly diminishing, these solutions that we have are slowly becoming insufficient. Little by little, we see the continual corruption of the very vital forces upon which we depend. And this corruption is simply due to misuse, perversion, the recognition uh, of this is important. Every individual who goes to school should be taught that every dishonest person is sick. That there is no such a thing as a successful individual who is not essentially a person of integrity. Everything else falls apart. We watch treaty after treaty among nations fall apart. We see the present mess throughout the world. We realize the tremendous struggle of ignorance to control mankind. Here we are in the 20th century and following rules that were decadent and obsolete 2,000 years ago. There are always some who will do it wrong, but we've never had in modern times so many do it, doing it wrong at the same time as we have at the present moment. And that is because we are becoming more powerful and we have greater advantages, greater skills, 
now we have to have greater integrity or our own achievements will destroy us. So I think it's very important that all of us try to think about these kinds of things. And uh, just for a little sort of appendix on the end of this, I'd like to see this is what we are trying to do here. I think that there is a job here. It will be a small job, but I think it is useful. I think we should try to create here in this group of people a, a nucleus of a people that are dedicated to transforming knowledge into wisdom, to gradually develop the powers and skills which will permit, permit, permit them to have a better life themselves and also pass on a better world to their descendants. So everyone that can possibly do so must play a part in the rediscoveries of reality and the rededication of a world that has tried to be a prodigal child and has found it all failing. We, we are sort of parts of the uh, story of the prodigal son. We are all part of something that we went forth to do it our way. Our way is no good. The only one way is the way that was ordained for us in the beginning. A way that is honest, equitable, and ends in glory, and in which pain fades away to the degree that wisdom takes over the ways of life. If we can understand these things, I think we'll all be better and happier people. Thank you.